Let's focus in. Get our Bibles out. All right, let's get our Bibles out. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. We've been in a series called Waiting. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That's the name of the title of the sermon. Sorry. We've been in a series called Hope in the Dark. Uh, believing God is good when life is not. Today's sermon is called Waiting in the Dark uh, because this is what our character is doing. So we've seen our character Joseph in a couple of different situations so far. First off, he is a young 17-year-old man and uh, he's got dreams presumably given to him by God and he decides he's going to tell his brothers about it and then they decide to kill him in response. But they don't do that since he's their brother. They decide to throw him in a cistern instead and, instead, and then sell him into slavery. And so uh, we talked that week about these truths. Uh, number one, uh, the, look at the top of your notes. Uh, God is always working behind the scenes of our lives. Okay? God is always working behind the scenes of our lives. And just underneath that, God sees to it that things happen in a certain way. Right? We're believing this. We're believing this no matter what happens. Joseph sold into slavery, and the only way he can continue to be faithful to God in the dark is to believe this, is to believe this wholeheartedly, that God is the one who's orchestrating these things, that God is still working even when things get difficult and dark and they stay that way, God is still working and everything he's doing is good, right, because he's seeing to it that things happen in a certain way, right, and then last week we talked about the fact that Joseph, being in Potiphar's house, presented with temptation multiple times in a row. And that when we are in dark seasons, difficult seasons, uh, the enemy, Satan, loves to tempt us to sin in those moments. Because it is never easier to justify anything that I want to do than when things aren't going my way. It is very easy to justify whatever sin that I'm being tempted with if things are not good. If I'm in a dark season, and certainly Joseph was living as a slave, and yet repeatedly by God's power, he is able to say no, no, no over and over again. His integrity is tested in the dark and comes out the other side still faithful. And as payment for that, he gets thrown in prison for something he didn't do. And that's where we encounter Joseph today. Okay, so just as a little review, I want to go back to chapter 39, and I want to read the last few verses of chapter 39, just because they kind of act as the introduction to chapter 40. So just so you know this, in case you don't know this about the Bible, so every word that's written in the Bible, we believe is inspired by God, okay, inspired by God, every word, Um, and uh, and those uh, original documents, uh, written in Hebrew, written in Greek, all of those things, uh, they originally came to us by way of just, you know, uh, uh, letters or stories. And so uh, we put the chapter numbers in there. We put the chapter breaks in the English translations. And we did this to make it easier to find things. Uh, but sometimes the chapter breaks um, aren't as helpful as... I would hope they would be because here in chapter 39, really what we have is the beginning of chapter 40. Um, So to set this up, I want to begin reading Genesis 39, right at the end of verse 20. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. Remember this, the personal name of God, Yahweh, was with him. He showed him kindness And granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. We've seen this movie before, right? This happened in Potiphar's house. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Now you might think, all right. He gets thrown into prison for something that he didn't do, and God's got a plan. And if you're Joseph, you might be thinking, okay, Lord, all right, okay, I'll go here with you. I'm I'm trusting you this far, Um, but could you get me out in a few days? That would be lovely. If you could just, you know, bust me out. I'm, I'm I'm not being kept here justly. I'm being kept here 
uh, for something I didn't do that's, that's a wrong against me. Lord, certainly you wouldn't let that continue too long. Maybe in a matter of days I can get out of here. And the very next verse says this, sometime later. Sometime later. I want to point your attention also to the opening words of chapter 41. We'll, we'll get there. We'll go through 40, but the beginning words of chapter 41, when two full years had passed. Okay. Um, Joseph's in prison for a long time. He's in prison for a long time. In fact, when everything goes down with his brothers, he's 17 years old. By the time he gets out of prison, when he gets out of prison and he's elevated by Pharaoh, he's 30. Okay, so for however much time he spent in Potiphar's house, in prison for something he didn't do, we're talking about years. Years. Many years, several years. Spent where he doesn't want to be and really where he shouldn't be. So here's my question to you. Have you ever spent a long period of time as in a season of life that you didn't want to be in? You ever spent a long period of time in a season of life you didn't want to be in? I'm sure that you have. This happens most frequently when maybe like Joseph, we saw something maybe coming down the line and we asked God to prevent it, but he didn't do so. He allowed it to play out in our lives. We deal with the difficulty and the frustration and the temptation that comes along with the dark season. And then we're asking God to bring that season to an end and he doesn't do it. And it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And even though I've done what I can do and even though I've prayed all the prayers that I can pray, it continues to go on. The pain persists. The symptoms continue. My kid continues to struggle. Our marriage continues in the same condition. I'm still lonely. We prayed, we've asked God, and it continues to go on. What happens now? Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning that only one of two things is going to happen. When you're in a season like that, only one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to get bitter or you're going to get better. And when I say better, I mean your faith will be stronger. Your confidence in God will run deeper or you'll become bitter, angry, convinced that God has slighted you, unnecessarily brought harm and darkness into your life for reasons you don't understand, and you've chosen to believe that it was wrong, that God got it wrong. This is the danger that we are in when we are in seasons that we would rather not be in for an extended period of time. So how do we ensure that when we get to the other side of whatever season that is, that we end up better and not bitter? Uh, we can learn from Joseph on this point. So let's go to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. Sometime later, okay, he's in prison. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker... Of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in the custody in the house of the captain of the guard. And it just so happens in the same prison where Joseph was confined. That's not just so happens. That's, again, God seeing to it, things happen in a certain way. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph. Again, not just so happens. This is God ensuring this happens. And he attended them. So it's a little difficult to put together exactly the situation that's occurring. Uh, but just by, you know, deductive reasoning and looking at how things worked in this culture at this time. In all likelihood, what has occurred is the Pharaoh has fallen ill or has suspected that there's a plot against him. And 
Which two ways would that plot potentially come to him? Uh, Through either the cup bearer, the one who's in charge of everything he drinks, or the baker, the one who's in charge of a lot of the things that he eats, namely the bread that he has. If you're going to get to the Pharaoh, if you're going to poison the Pharaoh, you're going to do it one of these two ways. And apparently there was a plot against him, and he decided, you know what, until I figure out what's going on, I'm throwing both these guys into prison. And they end up exactly where Joseph is. Let's continue. After they had been in custody for some time, again, look at the time marker, okay? Some time later, after Joseph's been in prison, these guys show up, and then even more time goes by. After they've been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own okay here we go number two in your notes sometimes god makes us wait in the dark sometimes god makes us wait in the dark you just imagine being joseph in this scenario we saw the markings of time for genesis 40 verse 1 sometime later And then again in verse 5, or verse 4, after having been in custody for some time, then two full years passing in chapter 41, the author wants us to see that time is going by. Time is going by. Joseph continues to be in a place he would rather not be in, and time is going by. That's the truth. Sometimes God makes us wait in the dark. And so here we go. Number one, what we believe when we must wait in the dark will determine whether we get bitter or get better. What we believe. That's what will do it. Maybe you've heard this from me before, but you take two people, person A and person B, and put them in the exact same circumstance. Maybe very similar backgrounds, very similar upbringings, put them in the exact same circumstance, and person A comes out bitter, and person A comes out better, and what's the difference? Is the difference that one person's season of waiting was more challenging than the other one? No, it's the exact same circumstance. The difference is person A chose to believe something that person B did not. And the same is true for us. That's what's going to determine it. That's why only one of two things is going to happen when we're in a season like this. Either we're going to get bitter and believe that God got it wrong in our lives or we're going to get better we're going to get spiritually stronger our trust in him will become more firm waiting in the dark is hard to do even the bible itself says so and the bible says why you don't have to turn here but in proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 it says this it says hope deferred makes the heart sick so even god knows this and put it in the bible Hope deferred, that word deferred means to be long drawn out and delayed. That means that if you have something that you are hoping for, something that you are really hoping happens, right? Many of us wait for many things. Maybe we're waiting for companionship. We've been waiting for it for a long time and it doesn't seem to be materializing in my life and I'm wondering what's going on. Maybe you have the companionship and you are married but you are waiting to have kids and you're trying to figure out why you can't and this is a long season of waiting for many people. Maybe some of them have stepped into a season where they've accepted the fact that they can't have kids of their own and they're trying to adopt kids and wondering why the process is so convoluted and difficult and full of delays. Maybe that's not your season. Maybe you've been diagnosed with something. You've got symptoms. You've got stuff going on physically, and you go to doctor after doctor after doctor, and there still isn't an answer. Whatever the case may be, Many of us, if not all of us, have been in a situation where we are waiting in the dark and we don't know what's going on and our hope has been deferred and even the Bible says it makes the heart sick when that happens. So you can only imagine that Joseph feels like he's in that place. And it is in this situation when we have a sick heart due to our hope being deferred, long drawn out and delayed, well, we think, no, why? It's because there's something we're hoping for that's been delayed. But here's what's interesting. Look at your notes. Number two, for God, there's no such thing as a delay. 
for God, there's no such thing as a delay. And you might think, well, God's in control and he's got the plan and he's working the plan. And even I know sometimes when you're working a plan, you have a delay here or there. But that doesn't happen to God. Think about why we delay something. Why do I delay things? I delay things because of unforeseen circumstances. That's why I delay things. Unforeseen circumstances. Okay. Is there such thing as an unforeseen circumstance for God? No. There's never a point where God says, whoa, I did not see that coming. Ha, I got to respond to this. Man, what are we going to do? Okay, quick, get the cupbearer and the baker and throw them in prison too. I didn't know this was going to happen. But no, unforeseen circumstances do not happen to God. That's why I delay things. I also delay things because of bad planning. They didn't prepare well enough, didn't plan well enough, okay? Does that ever happen to God? <laughs> Not once does he ever go, oh, man, I really thought that was going to work. Man, I, thought, I really thought that was going to work. You know, we get Joseph over to Egypt and then all stuff, but then... Man, the Potiphar and his wife thing? Who knew that was going to happen? And I really thought this, I really thought we had this thought through. That never happens to God. Happens to us. But it never happens to God. There's a verse in 2 Peter that I want to read for you. 2 Peter 3, verse 8 says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. This means that God is both in and outside of time in a way that you and I can't be. We can't be because we are limited by our humanity. We're limited by the fact that we are finite beings. Well, God is not that. God is infinite. He is inside and outside of time. And so he experiences things totally differently. And then it says this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. What he's saying there is, there's going to be some things that you want God to do, and it's going to feel like he's taken his time. It's going to feel like he's late. It's going to feel like he's called for a delay. Like we're in a baseball game or something. It's going to feel like, man, God's just being slow. No. That is not how this works. Look at number three. What we perceive as slowness on God's part is really patience. And what we perceive as a delay on God's part is really a plan in action. What we perceive as slowness on God's part is really patience. He says, I'm being patient. I'm being long-suffering. I'm saying, Lord, how, how long? Right? This is one thing I love. One thing I love about uh, Jeff Samuels, okay? One thing I love about Jeff Samuels, then I know there's not that many things to choose from, but, <laughs> you know, I had to take that shot, right? You know, I had to. But one of the things I love and appreciate about Jeff Samuels is that this man, as often as he possibly can, just about every day prays for the Lord's return, Right? Every day, prays that Jesus would come back. Every time I've been teaching down the legacy room, he's leading that room now. He prays that with them too. Prays that Jesus would come back. Prays it would be today. And he knows the truth. That's the best thing that could happen, right? That's the best thing that could happen. He knows this. He's praying this. And you might be tempted, Jeff, to believe after you've been praying that for a little while, that, man, what, what's taking you so long, God? Can't you see what's going on down here? Don't you see what they're teaching in the schools? Don't you see what's going on? Yes, he does see what's going on. There is no such thing as a delay. What we perceive as slowness is patience. And what we perceive as a delay is really a plan at work. And it is so important that we believe this. It is so important that we lock in with this. So... Let's take a look closely as we continue in the Joseph story at what we need to believe in order to ensure that we get better and not bitter when we have to wait 
in the dark. Chapter 40, verse 6. When Joseph came to them the next morning, this is the cupbearer and the baker, right? They had this dream. He saw that they were dejected. They were really sad. And so he asked Pharaoh's officials who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? I think it's kind of remarkable that Joseph is even cares about <laughs> anybody else in the prison, but he does. And we both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. I just want to say, this is, a, this is a truly stressful situation for them. In this time, dreams were taken very seriously. You have a dream like this that's so vivid that you can remember every detail of. Everybody at that time automatically assumed that means something and it means something significant. In fact, it's so significant that it has a bearing on reality. So we better figure out what this means, which is why Pharaoh's got all these magicians and all of these wisdom gurus and all that kind of stuff to figure out what dreams mean. And really, you know, they're not able to figure out a whole lot, but that's how seriously they take them. So you can imagine the cupbearer and the baker, they both have these dreams, no idea what they mean, and so they're distressed about this. We both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, now here is the key phrase, okay? This is today's key phrase that Joseph utters. There's so much revealed to us in this one answer that Joseph gives. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Okay. Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches, and as soon as it budded, it blossomed, and its clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and put the cup in his hand. Without missing a beat, Joseph says, this is what it means. The three branches are three days, and within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to when you were his cupbearer. Hey, good news. You're going to be restored to your position. Joseph tells him what his dream means without even missing a beat. Okay, now let's pause for a moment and let's continue exploring our question, right? What do we need to believe in order to ensure that we get better and not bitter when we have to wait in the dark? Okay, here we go. We must believe that, number one, only God knows what happens next. Only God knows what happens next. He says, do not interpretations belong to God? No one has access to this information other than God, and Joseph believed this. He believed that Yahweh and Yahweh alone had access to the future. No one else knows. Your magicians in Egypt, they don't know. Okay? I'm telling you here, pastors, we don't know. Okay? You're, you hear pastors saying a lot of crazy things. You ever listen to pastors on YouTube from other churches? I'm positive that you do. And sometimes you might hear them say something like, the Lord gave me a word. The Lord gave me a word for this next season and then says something that's going to happen in the future. Okay, I'm just telling you, pastors don't know. We can guess. I'm... <laughs> I ran, into, I ran into Tony here before the, before the service started. Tony, what did I tell you? I said, you got your Lions playing at 1 o'clock. I got my Packers playing at 1 o'clock. I said, by 4.30, one of our teams is going to be 1-1. One and one. It's not because they're playing each other. They're not. And then he didn't miss a beat. He's like, yeah, yours. <laughs> We're telling the future, apparently, right? We can take guesses. But we don't know. Nobody knows but God. And Joseph believes this. He has not yet lost faith in God's knowledge and power. He believes wholeheartedly. No, only God knows this. Interpretations belong to him, right? We got to know that. Look at this, number two. We must also believe that what happens next is in God's hands alone. Whatever happens next, God not only knows it, but it's also in his hands alone, which means he's shaping it. God doesn't know the future just because he's God and he knows things. He knows what's coming because he's shaping what's coming. 
And Joseph hasn't lost sight of this either. And I got to be honest with you. I'm not sure that I would have held on to all of this. I want to remind you what Joseph had. Okay, I have the Bible. We have praise songs and hymns. We have all of this stuff, right? We have behold our God. Seated on his throne. Come let us adore him. We've got that. What does Joseph have? He's got some stories from his dad and his grandpa in two dreams. This is what he's got. This is what Joseph has. And yet, he is still choosing to believe these things. Only, man, do not interpretations belong to God. That is a striking statement coming from somebody whose life has not gone well for a very long period of time. And he's been blessed, but he's been blessed within the context of these terrible circumstances that he's hoping to get out of. Man, this is incredible. We got to believe this. Only God knows what happens next, and what happens next is in God's hands alone. Also, number three, only God has authority over everything that happens in life. Only God has authority over everything that happens in life. Do not interpretations belong to God. Why? Because he's the only one that knows what things mean, because he's the one giving the dream in the first place. He's the one saying, hey, Here's what I'm doing in history. Here's what I'm doing in your life. And then here's the dream I'm giving you that's associated with that. Why? Because he has authority over all of it. It may be you can imagine a scenario where God had the power to deliver a dream about something, but then didn't have the authority to actually pull off the information that he's giving you in the dream, right? Joseph says, no, for sure. In three days, you're going to lift the cup to Pharaoh again. In three days. And he can say this confidently because he believes that God is the one who is in authority who will actually put the cupbearer back in that position. Not Pharaoh, not anybody else. Only God has authority for all things that happen. There is no such thing as a force that exists that can impose itself on reality and that God has to somehow respond to or react to. God doesn't react to things. God is the one behind things. He's the hand that is moving in my life and in yours. And we find ourselves in a season in which we'd rather not be for an extended period of time. It's God's hand who is there. It is his authority that has put us there, and only his authority will take us from there. Joseph believes all of this, but he also believes this. Look at number four. The wait will be worth it. He said... Well, how, how, do you, how do you get this? Look at this very carefully. Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. And how quickly does Joseph come up with the meaning? Immediately. Immediately. But look at what he said. He didn't say, hey, I've got, the, I've got the market cornered on dream interpretation. You should talk to me. I've got you situated. That'll be 1995. You give me your credit card information. Like, he didn't say that. He said, do not interpretations belong to God. They belong to God. And then he gets the interpretation immediately. Why? Because he's close to God. He can say, tell me your dreams with confidence because even in the prison, even where he is not where he wants to be, he has remained close to God by believing it would be worth it, that all of it would be worth it. You remember the, he has dreams too? You remember this? At the beginning of the story, Joseph has dreams. Do you think Joseph knows what his own dreams mean? I think he does. He's got no problem with everybody else's dreams. And here's how you know this. Why did the brothers want to kill him? It's not just because they found their 17-year-old brother annoying. It's because they knew what the dreams meant too. They, remember, dreams are taken seriously. They knew what the dreams meant too. Even the father says, after the sun and moon one, the father says, what, we're going to bow down to you? Immediately, they get, they're mad because of the interpretation, because they know what it means. Joseph knows what his dreams mean. He knows he's going to be put in a position of power. He knows all of that stuff. And yet, 
year after year after year continue to pass by and no fulfillment of the dreams that he received from God. The only way he stays close to God, close enough to continue to interpret everybody else's dreams when they come is if he chooses to believe that it'll be worth it. I'm choosing to believe God can be trusted. I'm still going to be close to him. I'm still going to stay close to God. He believes. He believes this about his own life and about his own dreams. So, we must believe. Only God knows what happens next. What happens next is in God's hands alone. Only God has authority and the wait will be worth it. Okay, but we must also wait. There's number four. We must also wait actively. Look at the next thing that Joseph does. He tells him the meaning. It says, hey, you're going to be restored again as Pharaoh's cupbearer. Here we go. But, verse 14, when all goes well with you, when all goes well with you, uh, remember me and show me kindness Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Okay. You don't think he wants to be out? Of course he wants to be out. And he sees his shot and he's taking his shot. Remember me. Show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh. Get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. And when the chief baker, the other guy, saw that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation to the cupbearer, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means, Joseph said. You too will be restored to your position. Nope, that's not what he says. This is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days, and within three days Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole. And the birds will eat away your flesh. Okay. (laughs) Here we go. Got to wait actively. Waiting on God. Got to wait actively. Number one, we must not tire of doing what is right and good. We must not tire of doing what is right and good. Joseph here is still committed to the truth. He's so committed to the truth that even when placed in a situation where he's hoping that these guys can do him a favor... He interprets this dream correctly for the baker. I don't know about you, but if I were in that position, I might consider, I might want to tell the baker something like, uh, yeah, I couldn't figure yours out. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> it's only going to be like three more days. I don't know, man. I don't know. Good luck, though. Good luck, though, okay? Good luck and remember me. No, he just tells him flat out. You're going to die. He's so committed to the truth. we got to be committed to doing what's right and good even when we're waiting for a long time and seeing God bless everybody else seemingly. And we can't get tired of that. Look at number two. We should do what we can do. We also should do what we can do. Joseph has this shot with the cupbearer, and he takes it. He takes the shot. He's not just sitting idly by. He takes the shot. The cupbearer comes, and he's saying, I've got an opportunity, and here's the reality, right? Look at number three. God uses ordinary means to achieve extraordinary things. God uses ordinary means to achieve extraordinary things. Joseph is thinking, who knows? Maybe my conversation, this ordinary conversation with the cupbearer will be the thing that God uses to get me out of here. And here's the thing. It actually is the thing that God uses to get him out of there, just not in the time that he wants, just not when. But it is the thing that he uses. God uses ordinary means to achieve extraordinary things. Yesterday, celebrated seven years married to the love of my life. Okay? Good job. Okay? I'm a lot, all right? So, and I'm weird. So, you know, kind of extraordinary. But any, if you've been coming to this church for any period of time, you know this. You know I didn't meet Caitlin until I was 30. We didn't get married until I was 32. I spent the entirety of my 20s single, not on purpose. Um, I did not wake up every day and go, how can I stay single today? I didn't do that. But that's the way that it played out. And there were some times that were really dark. And I was wondering what God was going to do. I had this desire in my heart. 
Little did I know all the things he was going to do with that choice. But there was a period of time where a godly man challenged me. And it was early on in my 20s. I was about 22 years old, still living in my parents' basement. And I told this guy, you know, I just just wish that I had a wife. I wish, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he looks at me and he says, what are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? What am I doing? I'm praying. He says, in your parents' basement. Yes. (laughs) He said, what's your plan here? I said, that God's going to drop off this beautiful Christian woman at the doorstep and she's going to say, hi, I'm here to marry Steve. And he said, you got you to change your situation. Go where there are people. So I decided to get involved in a young adult ministry in Grand Rapids. Yes, I went there to meet women. Also to get more of God, but I had plenty of God, okay? What I didn't have was, you know, but that's exactly how God delivered my wife to me and then delivered from there my children and all of this god uses ordinary means to achieve extraordinary things do what you can do right trying to have a kid you're doing all the stuff that's morally permissible to achieve that end trusting that god may use one of those things right but doing it as we said with an open hand i'm trusting that god is going to do what he's going to do and i'm not demanding these things but i have enough faith to continue to act even when i'm waiting because i'm not losing hope these are the things we got to do however look at the last thing in your notes number five we need to surrender every outcome to god every outcome it doesn't matter how many things I've tried, how many times I've prayed, how long I'm in this season. God gets to decide how long it is and when it ends. It will end, but God gets to decide. So, the chief cupbearer does remember Joseph just two years later. When Pharaoh himself has a dream, two dreams in fact, that he can't interpret doesn't know what they mean and right there cupbearer goes oh i know this guy actually that interpreted my dream you know it's been two years i'm sure joseph is like come on man like help a brother out but pharaoh becomes aware of joseph and then sends for joseph because he's so distressed by this dream says I had a dream and no one can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And right away, here's our boy, Joseph, still being faithful, says, I cannot do it. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Still trusting God, still giving him credit. In fact, he tells Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream, says there's going to be seven years of robust harvest and seven years of the worst famine that you've ever experienced and you should take the first seven years to prepare for the second seven years and then he says this in verse 33 or 41 and now let pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of egypt but i find it so interesting that he doesn't say and that man is me didn't say that He just says, here's what I think you should do. I think you should find a wise person and put him in charge and then let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land to take a fifth of the harvest of Egypt during the seven years of abundance and they should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come on upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. He's saying, you should put this guy in charge and here's the plan. You didn't ask, but I'm giving you two cents. And the plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials, so Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? And they put Joseph in charge. Dreams fulfilled. He is now vindicated. We'll see how he responds next week. But for now, here's the question. Are you going to get bitter or are you going to get better? Let me tell you. However long this season is, when you get to the very end of it, you get to the end of your life, I guarantee you, you will not regret having trusted God. But you'll regret having not trusted God. 
So when we get better or bitter, I hope we get better because we can continue to trust that the God who's orchestrating our lives knows what he's doing, even when it goes on and on and on. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your truth revealed to us in Scripture today. Let it settle in our hearts as we walk out of this place. May we carry it with us and may we trust you even in long, difficult seasons. You are worthy of that trust. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.